Good morning and welcome to Wintergreen Studios Virtual Land Art Bio Blitz. You are at the session called the Canada Wide Buzz about the City Canada. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Jess Pilo and I'm the project coordinator at Wintergreen Studios and I would like to turn it over to our volunteer Jessica who is going to introduce our first speaker of the day. Hi there, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us in this awesome workshop. Um, I'm Jessica Sobe and I'm the volunteer with Wintergreen. I'm just gonna be your video host this morning. Now I'm gonna just introduce um, our lovely guest, our lovely presenter, Shelly. So Shelly Candle um, is the director and founder of Bee City Canada, a national charity. She was always interested and active in environmental issues, but became tired and burned out of the environmental movement. She consciously chose to do something that brings people together. So Shelley's here today to talk about BC Canada's national work on protecting pollinators, and she will share what you can do to bring positive changes in your community. So take it away, Shelley. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really uh, very honored and grateful that you're here today and interested in learning something about pollinators in BC Canada. Um, so let's just get started. All right, so well, this is my garden. So what's Bee City Canada about? Well, it's about being friendly, being friendly to the bees and the other pollinators, um, being friendly to others as well, people and, uh, and places. Okay, so we got to start with a couple of jokes, right? So what do bees chew? Bumble gum. <laughs> and how do bees get to school? Wow, a school buzz. So I'm sure you're groaning, you know, maybe just waking up. <laughs> so start with a couple of jokes. All right, so Bee City Canada, we started in March of 2016 when Toronto became the first bee city in Canada. I mean, that was pretty awesome. You know, the fourth biggest city in North America, 44 four city councillors voted unanimously to become a B city. That was pretty, uh, quite, quite an achievement, quite a day. So we became a charity the next day and we're basically modeled after B city USA, which in the summer of 2015, I was in a small town in Ashland, Oregon and learned that they were a B city. Well, I was very curious and I had to know what the hell is a B city? Well, when I found out what it was all about, I thought, this is really cool. I like this idea. So I found the director, got in touch with her, and I said, so are there any bee cities in Canada? The answer was no. Well, obviously that all changed. It wasn't what I expected. I didn't think I'd run a charity, but here I am uh, four years later and uh, 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 quite enjoying this, this goal. Anyways, so what are our goals? Well, it's to engage and inspire communities to protect pollinators. Okay, let's start off by what is a community? Well, in the United States, they, uh, the B City USA movement was cities and campuses, so colleges. So we started off that way. I wanted to do exactly what B City USA was doing because they were very successful. And then things changed. I got a phone call from a teacher in Scarborough and she said, do you think you could come and talk to my kids? Cause I saw this Honey Nut Cheerio commercial and I learned that the bees are dying and I'm, I'm so upset. Can you come and talk? So I did, I came and gave a, a talk. I brought a few other people who were experts on bees and uh, we had a workshop and I looked at those kids' faces and I said, man, why don't we just do bee schools? You know, here we are. Um, kids care, um, they get it, they see how important pollinators are, so let's do bee schools. Well, after that, we thought, well, gee, what other communities can we engage? So we started engaging the business communities as well. Okay, so we wanna inspire and engage. So yes, there's the movement Save the Bees, um, but really the bees don't need saving. I mean, we need to wake up and figure out what the hell are we doing out there to make a better habitat for our bees. So I love tattoos and I saw this tattoo on a woman selling coffee and I just had to take a photo. So what, is, uh, what are the requirements for being a, a bee city school campus? Well, there's an application and it's really based on an action plan, which is why I love this bee city idea. The first action is to plant. So we're looking for habitat for pollinators. Habitat, habitat, meaning we want native plants. Uh, we want make sure there's water, uh, make sure there's nesting places that we're not mowing too much, like many, many different things. No pesticides, of course. The second thing is education, because what I found 
people don't know very much at all. And the third thing is celebration. That is very important too. Third week of June coming up, National Pollinator Week. So it's a great time to, to celebrate. So the important thing is, so there's an application and a resolution which says that pollinators are important for our community and the ecosystem, and we're gonna do what we can to protect them. And it has to be signed by the boss. So if the city, it's the mayor. If it's a, if it's a university, it's the chancellor or the dean. Uh, a business, the CEO, and if a school, it's the principal. So you have to have a, a consensus right from the top that this is what they wanna do. And we find this really does make success. So right now um, in year four with 39B cities and more are coming on, some really big cities, which can't share yet. We've got 40B schools, B campuses, 11, including um, University of Guelph and University of Calgary just became a B campus and 23B partners, including businesses. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this. I'm gonna share a little bit what I'm gonna talk about today. A little bit about bee city. I'm gonna show you some cool highlights. Then we're gonna go a little bit about bees and pollinators. I'm not sure what you know or don't know. And I do apologize if you know, if I'm not really giving you enough information, but we're sort of limited with time. And then I really wanna get into climate change because the bees really lead us to answers on everything and I'm going to get to some really fantastic things about climate change and then what we can all do. So I hope you're okay with that. Okay, a little quiz here. True or false? All bees make honey. Hmm. Well, can you figure out that out? Well, the answer is false. Not all bees make honey, really. It's basically the honey bee. And you know, around Canada, there's almost 900 species of bees. Most of them are solitary and live in the ground and they don't live in hives like the honey bee and the honey bee's not even from this area anyway. So that's another uh, thing that we could have a whole uh, hour to talk about is honey bees and they're fascinating and interesting, but not all bees do make honey, but bumblebees do as well, a little bit of honey. All right. So this is the Toronto celebration. There's a huge mural. I wonder if you can guess what bee it is. That's the official bee of the city of Toronto. Um, it's a sweat bee, very common, common bee. Now in uh, Western Canada, our first bee city was Chestermere, Alberta. And they used to use, they still use um, in Alberta a lot of uh, herbicides um, and that's included in the whole range of pesticides. And so instead of using pesticides after they became a bee city, they said, you know what, we're going to bring some goats in because we don't wanna treat areas around waterways with herbicides, especially waterways, because of course it's gonna infiltrate in our water and, uh, and cause serious damage. So they use some goats. So I thought that was a pretty co cool sign there. We're really proud that we have two First Nation communities that are also bee cities. So they're also communities. And of course they really care. Um, this is in their ancestral uh, heritage uh, to care for the land and they're extremely connected and uh, we're very, very grateful that that they're uh, supporting uh, Bee City Canada. Uh, this they had a parade with the tractor. They're doing really fantastic things. So some cool stuff. These are logos, um, floral logos. This one is in St. Catharines, the Bee City. This is our logo. Kawartha Lakes um, near Peterborough and this is Guelph. I don't know if any of you are from Guelph, I've seen this, this, this huge bee, but what a great tourist attraction. And also what a great opportunity to educate people. People will come, take their pictures and go, man, what is a bee city? Why a bee? Why is this so important? It's a great way to learn. So this is our, some photos from schools. This is our furthest school in Whitehorse, Yukon. Also um, a First Nation a community there. I think it's Tashani um, people, and this is uh, the word for bumblebee, Tanai. Another school near Ottawa, um, French school, and um, it, as you can see, they've got uh, a real Airbnb. <laughs> but it's really fun, fun for kids, and it brings the, the different kinds of species of bees. Okay, I'm talking about a little bit about the businesses. So the Calgary Zoo is a business and they became a bee city business. So they support us. And, uh, and in turn, they do what their three uh, action plans is planting. As you can see there, there's cone flowers there um, and signage, ways of education and, um, and also celebration as well. 
we asked, you have a church that's a bee church. Now at this particular church, they have honeybees, but really Bee City Canada has nothing to do with honeybees, really. I mean, um, of course they're a bee, they're a pollinator, but we're really focused on the native bees and all the other species, all the other insects that are pollinators as well. But we'll get into that. Okay, so this is a church. Um, this is Business Improvement Association. This is West Queen West in Toronto, very trendy area. And you can see these are 70 planter boxes. We can't see all 70 of them, of course, but these are planter boxes with, um, with native plants and it's all edible and you can see all the flowers. Well, of course, these flowers are gonna attract bees and uh, butterflies uh, and other insects. And, no, every, and so there's thousands of people that walk by here every day and uh, it's just a beautiful way to enhance the, uh, the area. And, and people can see, well, the bees aren't bothering me. They don't sting or anything like that. And then the other cool thing is if you notice on the left-hand side, the little picture right above Rob, um, there's a little bee house. So it was really a, a pollinator, pollinators, pollinators paradise, two kilometers, and it's a true Airbnb. There's some other photos. Okay, and we actually have a bee golf course, which just happened last year. Now, why is that so important? Now, this part is uh, in, uh, in Halliburton. Um, it's, uh, it's in Port Severn, and it's a UNESCO area. So it's a very um, uh, important ecosystem. So they don't use any, any sprays at all, no fungicides, no herbicides. Um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, and they're planting native plants in the areas, and a lot of areas are natural and all that stuff. So it's actually uh, really important because oftentimes we think about golf courses as using very heavy on pesticides, and they're really trying to change the perception. So what a better way than to become a, a, a bee golf course. All right, so pollination. So what is pollination? You know, everybody talks about it. Um, maybe you hear, I, I don't, we don't, can't, Unfortunately, we can't share um, if you know about it, but is it something to do with making honey? Well, this is what a lot of people think, that pollination has a lot to do with making honey, but of course that's false. I mean, uh, making honey that comes from nectar, um, uh, from the flowers, but really pollination is about creating seeds. It's about uh, reproduction of plants. It's actually this beautiful relationship between the flowers between the plants, the shrubs, the trees, and the insects. The insects that carry the pollen. As you can see, this little bee's got lots of pollen. Well, that's the male part of the plant. So the pollen's all over the bee. The bee's going to another flower looking for nectar. And then it just inadvertently passes over the stigma. And with the stigma is the female part. So the pollen goes on the stigma, goes down a tube, and a seed is, is, um, is formed. And of course we get our fruit, our apples, our seeds from there. Animals get their food from there. So it's not just one in three bites of food. Actually that, that slogan really bothers me because it's not just about us humans. There's more, we're not the only ones here on the planet. And they also rely on pollinators. In fact, without pollinators, there would be no life on this planet. Uh, even in the ocean actually there's, um, in, in some areas they use there has pollinators as well. Okay, so who are the pollinators? Well, yes, of course there's bees. Like I said, there's about 900 species in Canada, about, about 20, over 20,000 around the world. Um, in Canada, we have a hummingbird. Um, there's beetles that are really good uh, pollinators. Uh, they work really hard. Flies, as you see, there's a fly on the bottom right-hand side. Um, now the fly only has two wings, the bees four. Um, but, you know, they're tricky and they look like bees um, and the butterflies and moths as well. Um, other countries, it's, uh, it's more, more some mammals um, and, uh, and bats as well, but not here in Canada. Okay, so there's thousands and thousands of species. I mean, just in flies, there's like, a, I think, a, a, around 125,000 different flies that are pollinators. All right, so um, let's just talk about... Uh, uh, I wanted to get into a little bit about climate change and, um, and what are their solutions. And like I said, the bees really take us to, uh, to the solutions. So what about industrial farming? You know, because we need to think about land. This is really what's important 
Why are pollinators in decline? Well, what have we done to our land? I mean, we've gotten rid of wetlands. We've gotten rid of uh, prairie grasses in Canada. And some of our agriculture looks like the photos in front of you. Um, this is not healthy for pollinators. Where are the flowers? Where's the food? As you may know, uh, bees, pollinator bees especially, they're, they're just looking for flowers. So you need to plant. So is there hope? You bet. There is hope, which is, excites me, um, which is uh, why I just love to share this information. Okay, so I'm going to show you um, a, a little uh, clip from, uh, this was from a news item, Global News, uh, to talk about regenerative agriculture. And you'll see how the bees are involved. Six years ago, Paul Kernelligan and Aaron Dancy were worried about their farm and that they wouldn't be able to feed their cattle. We were in some wet years. Uh, what we were growing, barley and oats, kept drowning. Um, got the idea to try something else. They opted to change their fields and embrace sustainable, regenerative agriculture. We've mined our soils and our soils are going the wrong direction. And so this is the whole idea of regenerative ag is we don't want to sustain what we are. Um, what we want to do is we want to build on our soils. We've lost about uh, two thirds of organic matter in our soils. It's time to build it back. By mixing in plants that grow at different rates, Elmi says the soil's nutrients and the bees are returning. The bees function as a biological barometer. The more pollinators you have, the healthier the soil and the field. And Kenelig and Dancy say sustainable agriculture has brought back their bee population. Definitely, yeah, like I mean, the alfalfa might have had some, but yeah, like the, the flowering species we have now, you definitely see more. And they say the return of bees is good for business. When you get higher quality in your feed to the animal, then that obviously comes through in the milk side of it. We feel our cows are healthier, they breed back better, um, they produce a lot more butter fat and butter protein, uh, milk protein. The improvements even caught the attention of General Mills. Now, this is all important to, you know, trying to build, rebuild that soil health from the, the areas where we, uh, where we source the ingre ingredients, because ultimately to move into the 21st century, to be able to cope with the big challenges that we have, we need a healthier soil base. Those challenges, like soil depletion, are significant. But Kernelligan says the bees are a sign that he's found a solution. It's encouraging. It kind of lets you know that they're happy with what you got and you're helping out the ecosystem, I guess. And, and it's just a, such a small thing to do. Nathaniel Dove, Global News. Six years ago. All right. So, um, so regenerative agriculture, to me, it's a win, 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 win. <laughs> it's a, it's a win for the pollinators because we're talking about biodiversity on the farm. We're talking about many different species, as you can see. So a win for the pollinators. Also, um, a win for the soil because the soil requires um, biodiversity as well, uh, healthy soil. Um, and a win for the farmers because really they're they're as you, as you heard um, as farmers say the the herd is healthier um, birthing is better uh, they the cows are healthier the milk is higher fat so and also it's good for their pocketbook too they're making more money um, so you can see even General Mills is quite interested in fact they've um, they have mandated uh, their commitment to a million acres over the next few years that they're going to just source from regenerative farmers and help farmers um, uh, move to in, in this direction. So, um, so the thing about regenerative agriculture, which, which we're always looking above ground when we're talking about maybe climate change, um, we're looking, um, well, you know, maybe planting trees and all this stuff thinking about things above ground yes that's really important why is that important why is it so important to plant because it's photosynthesis that brings the co2 the carbon it, it takes the carbon and it not only does it provide it for the plant about maybe 50 to 60 percent of it goes into the plant but it also goes down into the roots. And to me, when I learned this, it was like a aha moment for me. I have a degree in agriculture. I studied soil science. 
but really this never really just filtered in my brain that went, oh my God, what is happening down in the roots? So I have the next video that I wanna show you, which will hopefully get you to understand a little bit that the life really is underneath the ground. So in a teaspoon of soil, there's more microorganisms there are people on the planet. So it's, there's that much going on. And soil health means that the soil becomes like a sponge. And so what it can do when there's heavy rains, the, the sponge absorbs the water and can hold it. It holds the water in case there's droughts or in case other things, un unforeseeable things, so that the plant can then utilize the water that's in the soil. So what we have now, if you look, we have heavy flooding. Why? Because our soil is so degraded. We've lost organic matter. Um, when um, settlers came in the, you know, to the plains in the 17 or 1800s, there was like 10 inches or a foot of organic matter. Now it's like an inch to a half an inch, which is why farmers around the world are experiencing real hardships. Okay, let me show you this. These towering Douglas firs depend on networks of tiny fungus for water and other nutrients. We typically see only the fungal fruits that poke above the soil, mushrooms. But a lot is happening under the surface. Let's dive below ground to take a closer look. Living fungal threads called hyphae connect the mushroom to an underground network of activity. Ants help maintain healthy soil, aerating the dirt, circulating water, and moving nutrients around. Tiny moss mites dine on miniature worms called nematodes. Nematodes consume single-celled amoebas, far smaller than our eyes can see. Amoebas devour even tinier bacteria. And bacteria also need to eat. They feed on the remains of previous generations of forest dwellers. In nature, nothing is wasted. The fungal hyphae decompose matter too. And we can follow them toward the roots of the Douglas fir. The fungus wraps around the root tip. Viewing a slice through the root, we see hyphae pushing into the spaces between the tree cells. At the molecular scale, a chemical exchange takes place. The fungus supplies the tree with much needed minerals, while the tree provides the fungus with energy-rich sugars. Nutrients for energy, a fair trade. Okay, so just to recap, um, it's quite incredible how, how we can see what's going on underneath. Uh, a little clip just sort of blew me away when I first found it. Um, so the thing to understand is that there is this relationship. There's a symbiotic relationship between the hyphae and, um, and, and, the, and the plant. So basically, the plant saying, you know what, I need some phosphorus, I need some manganese, I need this, I need that, can you go get it? They bring it, and in return, they get the carbon. Um, and, and it's a very great relationship. So basically, the plants know exactly what they need, and the hyphae can go get it. You see the way the, the strands are, and uh, how they... Um, and how they move quite distances. So what we've learned is that in forest, in fact, that there's communication between trees. 
So if there's a tree in trouble that needs some minerals, the hyphae, the, the message gets to the, the mother tree, that sometimes it's called, and she sends back um, uh, help for this tree. It's incredible. But it not only happens in forests, but it also happens in our gardens and in our fields, in our farmer's fields, which is why when you plow, you're plowing that hyphae. You're plowing this, this incredible mechanism. It's like uh, our nervous system that happening. It's quite a communications and there's going to be more and more research uh, up, about this. So the thing to also note is that when we put fertilizer or fungicide or herbicide or insecticide on anything, we are destroying the life in the soil. So that's something to really take note of and, and to note that we don't need that stuff when the soil is healthy. And for some farms, maybe it'll take a year or two or a couple of years, but we need support farmers. We need to understand that farmers are the heroes of climate change, the future heroes, and maybe the present futures. This is a movement around the world, regenerative agriculture. So we're learning that the soils, when they're healthy, they can bind the carbon and they can hold it in the ground. So, and they figure that, you know, if we were to get on this around the world, we could reduce the CO2 levels in the atmosphere um, considerably uh, within like maybe five, 10 years. It's that simple uh, what, what nature is teaching us what to do. And also the water content in the soil is critical because we've lost that ability because the soil no longer acts like a sponge absorbing water we, we, with the, what the soil degradation is causing all these floods and all these droughts around the world. So I hope there's questions about this because it's really very exciting. So what are our plans for the future? Um, well, we'd like to get into schools because we think education is critical. We'd like to start B-City ambassador programs around the country. Um, We'd, we're like looking for support from businesses for this. Um, there'd be some, a lot of transparency on the website as well on how to do this. Because what I'm finding in schools is kids don't know because teachers don't know very much. They don't know really about pollination. They don't know who the pollinators are. They don't know what to do. There's fear about bees. Most bees don't, don't sting either. So the other thing that we're doing is we have a pollinator pledge on our website. Um, hopefully that you can see this. If you just go to bcitycanada.org, you'll see it, it's a pollinator protector and there's a map. Uh, today we've got like 384 people who have signed up, um, but we'd certainly like more. So we'd love for you to share this um, on, on, uh, on whatever social media that you're using. So I love jokes. Look, dad, a bee, quick, get me a rolled up newspaper. And then thanks for all you do for this planet, little bee. So uh, I, I want to leave some time for some questions and things. I know we didn't get to, I didn't get to talk much ab about uh, a lot of different kinds of bees and bees are my, my favorite. You know, uh, if you can see the poster book behind me, it's pretty small here, but there's, these are just species in, uh, uh, in North America, some. Um, there's like 110 here on this board. And uh, every time a city becomes a bee city, I try to make a presentation. I give the mayor one of these so <laughs> to make sure that they know that there's more than just a honeybee. So just so you're thinking, you know, sometimes we think, oh my God, what can I do? We've got so many world problems. I mean, what is it possible that I could do? But just like the honeybee, you know, they can only, the honeybee um, uh, is able to help out in producing uh, um, collectively just a, an, a third of a teaspoon of honey but collectively the whole hive produces 80 pounds of honey uh, a year so just think that your actions combined with other people's actions will make a difference so if I if anything's happened in this I just hope that I can inspire you um, the way the bees have inspired me to take action is that we can all inspire each other uh, to take some kind of action, whether it's for the first time you're going to buy seeds and plant a garden or grow some vegetables, because vegetables are great for pollinators. They have flowers or herbs or something like that. And even if you live in a balcony 
or maybe you're going to learn something about bees. Maybe you're going to do something you've never done before. Maybe even go to the protests that are happening now uh, about racial discrimination. Maybe do, doing something that you've never done before. Just take positive action and your life will change. It's, it has for me. So thank you all so much for being here. And uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions that you, you may have. Thank you so much, Shelly. I love that um, inspiring, beautiful message at the end about being one small action, but in com combination with everybody else's actions. I love that. So if anybody um, watching has questions and they have not yet put them in the Q&A, go ahead and jump in there and write your questions. Rena says, we had a wonderful presentation by Jason Liao a couple of days ago that unfolded that he's a director on your board kudos to having such an impressive teenager on your board. How many <laughs> members are on your board? What interests do board members represent besides you as embodied by Jason? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for, I'm so glad you listened to Jason. Uh, he's, he's, he's quite a young man. I've known him for a few years and was blown away when he, when he told me he was putting out these pollinator gardens, you know, at age 15 or 16. And um, what he's done is really quite incredible. So, um, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in bringing youth uh, around the table. You know, it's your future. It's their future. And, uh, you know, they have a voice. And in fact, I just want to just share something that of all the B cities, four of them were really became B cities because of high school kids. They, they made a presentation to their city council and, uh, and then they got interviewed in the papers and all that stuff. But but so kids can really uh, make it make a difference. Um, as I said, uh, when we try really to empower them, it's important. So some of our board members, uh, there's um, a young woman, she's from University of Guelph. She actually got Guelph to become a B, a B campus, which was really huge considering it's the agricultural campus of Canada. And uh, then we have Lauren Whitmer. He used to work for the Ministry of Agriculture um, in the uh, and so he was responsible for a pollinator action plan, which for the Ontario government, which was really to take a million acres and uh, to convert it to pollinator habitat. Now, um, the new government that came in, um, they put that aside. I'm really hoping that we can bring it back, that we can bring everybody to the table. That's why actually the pledge is important because the more names we get, the more we can then go to the politicians, the provincial politicians, and, and get things done. So we have um, Lincoln Best, he's also on our board. He's a taxonomist. He is the expert in Canada, really about native bees. So if you have a native bee, actually he can identify them. Like he's always under his microscope. Uh, he's leading uh, something right now in Oregon, um, the Bee Atlas. And uh, they're trying to uh, identify every species of bee in, in Oregon. So it's quite a project. Um, and yes, there's some other youth as well, another university student, and then someone from uh, Calgary, um, David Mesfelt, and he's quite incredible. He, he's just someone who cares, right? Doesn't, you know, didn't have, not an expert or anything, but knew he needed to plant habitat for pollinators. Uh, so he did on, on a place called Canyon Meadows, and he engages people. So he engaged university students and engaged professors there. And so after uh, a year, the, after the first year, he planted uh, just a beautiful place and they found a rare species of bee, a cuckoo bee. And it made headlines around Canada on CBC radio and everything else. So here he was, look what he was able to do. You know, you plant and they will come. And I said, this was a very rare species of bee that they found. And, and now the project is widespread, really, about Calgary. And then Calgary's become a bee city and University of Calgary bee campus, and they're all working together. So it's just the action of the good intentions. It really makes a difference. But thanks for asking that question. My next question, again, from Lena. How is your organization funded? So, uh, well, I'm a volunteer. Um, Maybe, yeah, maybe I've been the director so long because they, they can't fire volunteers, <laughs> but, um, uh, well, we get charity, we get donations, basically. Um, and the cities have a small fee as well that we've implemented. The first year is free. When we first started, there were no fees. So we, we're pretty bare bone, you know? I mean, the office is my house here, coffee shops, and, uh, 
and uh, we have very limited expenses and the money that we spend is really for school so every time we get an application from a school we send them a hundred dollars and every renewal we send them a hundred dollars and we would really like to send schools more money because i said the kids really need help they need to go on field trips they need to see how food is growing you know our children are very disconnected um, but we could always use help for fundraising <laughs> Oh, awesome. And I bet if they visited the website, maybe there'd be like a donate now button or something. Yes, that's right. It's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a charitable, you get a tax tax receipt for that. And we get individual donations. And you know, in fact, we get a lot of donations from schools, from kids, you know, we have, we've had six year olds who wanted to donate all their birthday party money to, to help save the bees. You know, we, we just, yeah, like the kids are really fantastic. I said, kids really, they, they get it. They really care very much so. Question from Monica, are there plans to have Bee City Homes? Bee City Homes? Um, oh, you mean so individuals could be part of Bee City? Is that, was that the question? I think so, yeah, like individuals. Um, well, what we've done for individuals is put this pledge out there, which tells you what, what you can do to protect pollinators. So it's, you know, what kind of plants to plants to plant, um, you know, no mowing, you know, I think May is no mow and, you know, getting rid of your grass and putting more native plants, um, things like turning your lights out, which is really important for the moss, for the night pollinators. Um, and and uh, yeah, everything's I said on, on the website. So that's really what we've done for individuals. Um, um, but we'd certainly, maybe if you have some ideas on how to gauge individuals, I'd be happy to hear that. We're, we're always open for new ideas and engaging, engaging more people. But we do want to encourage you, if you're living in a, a township or a little village or something and you want your community to become a bee city, just contact me and I can, you know, help you out. Um, there's been PowerPoints that have been sort of passed around. Um, that have been successful that you you can present to city council but it's really good to to find a um a, a city council person who who can help out you know who thinks it's a good idea um yeah and uh so that those are some things that you could do as individuals you know and help helping out and you also your schools if your kids or you're at a university or your businesses you know no matter how big or small a business can be um, you can certainly uh, help in protecting pollinators. Yeah, and like you said, every small action combined will make a big difference. Absolutely. Um, we have another question. It says, I believe hummingbirds are attracted to red flowers. Are there particular colors, at least to the human eye, that bees prefer? That the bees or just the, the hummingbird? The bees? No, that bees prefer or that other people. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the bees, uh, yeah, so they have a, a, a different uh, spectrum. And so they like, they like colors like uh, yellow and uh, purple and blues and, uh, and whites. But they don't, they're not after, after reds, after red colors. Um, that's true. I can't recall. I mean, I I haven't looked this up in a while about their about the range of colors. But maybe if if you know if someone knows that wants to to jump in and and share that. What would an ambassador program look like? Oh, B City Ambassador Program. So uh, what it would look like is um, uh, someone would go into the school, a B City Ambassador, and uh, and provide kids with workshops. It might be uh, maybe one to three workshops. It might help the kids uh, uh, start a garden. Um, and there'd be no cost to the school. The idea would be that it's it's pretty hard to change curriculum, but, but not so difficult to go into schools um, to, to teach kids about pollinators because they're the I find the principals and the teachers are really excited when an expert can come in and, and share their knowledge with with kids so the, the thing is is okay if we can do that we just need to get help get funded for this and so we're looking to businesses I had put proposals to General Mills and to Crayola um, as yet I haven't heard back this thing with the pandemic you know everything's sort of be sort of on hold with that but, um, but I still make an effort myself of going into schools and talking to kids. And you can start at, at, at nursery school, you know. I think all kids should know the difference between a wasp and a bee. 
you know, and, and getting rid of this, this fear that we have, which is unfounded in many ways, um, and addressing that. So that's what the obesity ambassador program looked like. The obesity ambassador themselves would be paid. I think that's really important to pay people uh, to go into schools and, and teach kids. And, uh, and so there'd be, you know, we'd have to look after um, the ambassador program just so what exactly they're gonna be teaching and how they'd be doing it and always improving. I always believe in, in improving um, our, our skill set to make it really interesting for the kids, uh, et cetera. I do see that we have a couple of questions from Jesse, one of our attendees. Um, two questions. The first one is, are some bees poisonous? Um, I don't think any bees are poisonous here in Canada. Um, <clears throat> not that I'm aware of. Um, as I said, a lot of bees don't sting and they don't bite as far as, as I know. Um, so uh, it's, it's a lot actually don't sting at all. And, you know, for some bees, they're really just interested. Most bees, they're just interested in the flowers. They're really not interested in us. It's the wasps that, um, that are more aggressive because they're carnivores. So they're after insects, but they're extremely important in the ecosystem. And I just read a wonderful article about wasps saying how, how they indulge in a lot of insects. So if you, if you don't like a lot of other insects, you certainly want to have a lot of wasps around the larva as well. So no, I'm not familiar with it around the world. I don't know. I could look that up, um, uh, uh, to see if there's some poisonous bees, but that's a good question. Thanks for that. And then Jesse's other question is what is your favorite flower? Oh, that's a good question. You know what? It's, Actually, I'm going to say this year it's sunflowers. I planted about 20 sunflowers around my garden. <laughs> I think I've gone sunflower crazy. And I was also thinking uh, I'm going to plant them in little pots and then I'm going to put them out by the end of my driveway and I'm going to let people take them. So maybe we'll have sunflowers everywhere. Because, you know, on my street, almost it's like a, like my, my garden is a little bit of an oasis and the rest seems like it's a desert. So, you know, maybe my actions, you know, I have sign on my lawn too. It's a little hard to change my, my neighbors. So sometimes you feel you're really alone in this world. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, as I said, slowly, slowly, our actions can, can help us. Thank you so much, Shelly. And thank you, Jessica, for hosting. Um, I have put the link for Bee City Canada into the chat. So if you would like to connect with Shelly and find out more about the work that she is doing, you can connect with her there. We hope to see you at our next session and enjoy this beautiful day outside.